This is Andy Perrault for Boxing Social in association with Betfred, and I'm delighted to be joined by Sky Sports' Adam Smith um, over Zoom. Adam, first and foremost, how are you doing? Very well. Very well, Andy. Yeah, uh, another good weekend um, at Wembley. And uh, for once, bubble free this week. Um, I don't know what Eddie and I are going to do with ourselves, but it's uh, it's nice actually to have a few days, you know, back with the family and obviously sort of um, rethinking sort of tactics and, um, you know, plans for, for the coming weeks and months as opposed to sort of just something that's just in front of you because it's been pretty relentless um, for the last number of weeks and months. And uh, so it's nice just to have a little bit of a clear air. And, um, you know, we've got obviously... Billy Joe Saunders and a big show next week. And then we've got uh, Anthony Joshua, the huge one against uh, Kubrat Pulev on December the 12th. So it's um, it's a chance for us just to sort of think of some you know, ideas towards those shows and obviously think uh, beyond into sort of January and February and uh, just take a bit of stock and, and take a bit of stock sort of reflecting back to what was, you know, a, a fantastic, what has been a fantastic time. You know, Katie Taylor you know, having 2 million views, you know, across the board because we opened it up on Facebook and on YouTube and that was absolutely brilliant. And, uh, you know, to see that. And then, you know, Conor Ben on, on Saturday night did huge viewing figures for us. It did really well. And, uh, you know, he, he put in a great performance. So I think there's a real momentum and not just us, you know, we've got BT this weekend. They've got the uh, huge fight between Daniel Dubois and Joe Joyce, which I cannot wait for. I think it's one of the really good matches of the year so far and um you know then we've got you know you've got the, the the tyson jones sort of exhibition back end of the night people have their different theories on that i'm not a fan but you know you, you will sort of be watching it like that i guess you know and uh and then the week after it's it's billy joe saunders um and also obviously they've got a, a big american show with danny jacobs too and we've got the golden contract as well coming up early part of next week it's uh, just trying to keep up with everything and then AJ Pulev on December the 12th. There's a lot still to happen. Callum Smith's obviously fighting the week after against Canelo. So it's a huge you know, period um, pre-Christmas, pre the sort of Christmas, you know, bubbles and lockdowns just being lightened a bit and everyone getting together. It's a fantastic time for, for fight fans to enjoy what we've got in, in the boxing ring. And I think there's loads happening from all sorts of broadcasters, promoters around the world. And yeah, we're very happy with, with our with our schedule and what we're uh, providing, but uh, it's part of a, you know, a bigger picture of what, you know, the world seems to be. I think everybody's you know, dealt really well with the pandemic and the fact that we managed to get boxing back and really good fights back on and it's excellent. And so, uh, yeah, really, really pleased and a nice push before Christmas and then we can have a little, uh, little bit of downtime. And um, just to kind of touch on the scheduling side of things before we do move on to this past weekend, you, you mentioned kind of, the volume of shows there, whether it be with yourselves or it be with Frank Warren or over in the States. When boxing returned on the back of lockdown, did you kind of imagine that there would be this heavy schedule of, of shows at week in, week out? Or did you expect there to be more? Did you expect there to be less? How have you found kind of the boxing's return effectively over these past five, five or so months? I've been really impressed. I mean, the first thing you've got to say is that everything has been much harder. Um, no gates, one thing. You know, no crowd atmosphere, huge, hugely important. We love the fight fans there, number two. And number three, obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic and still are. There's another wave. There's a lockdown going on at the moment. More and more, you know, positive tests for COVID. Um, so it's been a really hard operational, organisational, um, you know, few weeks and months so i think look i as i said to you i think during the sort of first lockdown and the period where there was no sport um you know i, I said to you at that time that look we, we're not going to be the first sport back it's a dangerous sport you know paramedics and doctors are going to be needed on the front line and we weren't the first sport back i think robert smith brought us back sensibly you know with a number of shows on a card how we could do it i think you know bt and sky and everybody else and across the pond as well reacted to their different rules and restrictions and i think everybody's got on with it so i think fight camp was fantastic i think that was a, a real innovation i think it was a brilliant idea from eddie and frank and matt Truman. and i think that was a the fact that there were so many really good fights on at all sorts of different levels and really good stories and you know fighters could get out and, and, and box again and, and earn money i think that was terrific um to get a, a huge box office night like white pavekin and taylor pursuit over the line in, in in these sort of times 
with no fans paying gate money was extraordinary. Um, you know, then we managed Usyk Chisora. Now we've got AJ and Pulev. You know, we've, we've lost one because of, of the COVID with Povetkin, and that will be the back end of January now. But we've seen with BT, they've struggled to put Tyson Fury on. Um, he was going to fight on December the 5th. It's hard to put any sort of big events on because there's so much money involved. Um, but I think also maybe what one or two people don't understand out there is the operational side. And the fact is that everything is so much stricter and more rigid and more difficult, you know, with, with social distancing and with, you know, the, the different ways you can be around ringside, the, the, the different sort of, you know, difficulties it has, you know, planning these events. Um, and that's why getting the sort of Wembley residency was, was fantastic because at least we've got a place where, we know the bubble works. We know the venue works. And I think it looks fantastic. I've been really impressed with the, the creativity side and, and, and how it looks. You know, it will never be the same as having fans there. We, we, we miss fans hugely, whether it's at the O2, at a stadium, whether it's wherever, Manchester Arena, anywhere around the country, you know, even in York Hall. There's loads and loads of places we love going. And, and that's, that's part of boxing, that you've got the fan fever there and, and everybody's around and everybody's living and breathing it. And the, fan, the fans love it and the fighters, you know, really enjoy sort of, you know, performing for that, with that big buzz. Um, but I think what we've seen is the fighters have been fit and ready, mentally and physically the best they could have been in what's been a, such a difficult year. And I think probably, you know, our sport more than any others, they've been ready to go and they are at their very best. And I think some of the performances have been better than any of them have had before because of the concentration on the night and the fact that you can listen to your corner, there is quiet around. And although it's sort of spooky and eerie at times, Actually, the fighters have been going out there and really blinkered and concentrating on their performances. Katie Taylor, what a terrific performance the other night. You know, Teofimo Lopez, Javonte Davis, some of the best performances of their career. You know, Connor Ben, best display yet on Saturday night. You know, I think that what that's that's really helped some fighters who have needed to make big statements. You know, that they've actually been able to concentrate more. It's not the same. It's fraught with difficulties. As Eddie said, it's almost like Russian roulette every week. You don't know who's going to pass the test, who's not. But my hat goes off to the, the organisational skills of, of Matchroom and all the other promoters out there. But Matchroom have been phenomenal. You know, it's been so tight in that bubble. You know, all the testing has been incredible. And then the, you know, the facilities uh, in what's a very claustrophobic and difficult, you know, environment have been, you know, first class and i think they deserve a lot of credit and the people you know in the background of sky sort of for even putting these shows on it's great and we can't have everything we can't have some of the blockbuster fights we want which you know we need with gates but i think that everybody who's been dealt the same sort of cards has got on with it and it's been fantastic and the fighters have got out you know look at a couple of those those first fights on saturday night you know, with, with boxers who would normally fight on small hall shows, you know, unfortunately, that's not happening. I think it's it, it's sad that the government haven't invested. That's what we want. We want more investment into to grassroots. We want more investment into the amateur to gain because we don't want them to lose interest over these difficult months. But it's really good that we can have, you know, fighters come out like Davis, you know, his performance on Saturday night, like Jez Smith, and they, they just come in at, you know, very short notice. They're fit, they're ready, and they get their opportunities. And, you know, I think that's that's a real feel-good factor. So I think a lot's gone right. I think a lot of the promotion, which has been in the bubbles, has been great because we've had everyone there and, and fighters feel like they're, they're sort of superstars, even if they're not the main event. And, you know, they get the, the pictures, they get their interviews, and they, you know, they, they're, they're really enjoying being on the Sky Sports platform. So, so that's been great. We've seen some really good numbers. And um, while we don't have the, the luxury of being there with all the fans and the, the normality, we've all had to adapt. You know, Matt and I are commentating from way back. You know, we're not together. We're separated. It's it's really hard. You know, it's not like, you know, you, you can have a, a conversation at ringside, which is the norm. You know, the presenters are, are, are far back. You've got, you know, you can't get to, to Eddie, for example, on the night because you were different pockets in different restrictions you know you know Rob and I were trying to do something on, on the night we couldn't because 
you know, one's in one area, which is tested. I'm in the non-tested after I've been tested. It's complicated, but there's areas, you know, and then there's the, the, the producers that work in, directors that work in the, in the VT trucks. You know, they've got to be, it's, it's a different way. It's, it's hard. It's a real hard operation. And I think that, you know, those, those people that have worked, you know, night and day to make sure these events go on are the ones that deserve, like the fighters, the most credit because the show has gone on. We have adapted. And I'm really impressed, more impressed than I, I thought I would be about what has happened. I think we've done more fights across the board, not just Matchroom and Sky, across the board. I think there's been some great nights. As I said, really looking forward to this one with, uh, you know, Joe Joyce and Dubois on Saturday. We can, I can sit back and actually relax and enjoy the show, which is fantastic. And then back in for our schedule, which is terrific up until Christmas. So, yeah, I think everybody's done really well. And, um, you know, it's, it's hit pockets hard. It's been hard financially, um, and everybody's had to take that, you know, that approach. But look, fighters have come, and, and fighters have even got two or three outings already, which is, you know, it's brilliant. And the fact that we, you know, we weren't we weren't in business until sort of, you know, or early August or late July. I mean, it's uh, it's incredible what the second half of the year has provided. But you know, the, the message is important that we want everyone to stay as as healthy and as safe as possible. That's the, the key, and that we will get back to a normality. Who knows when, but there will be crowds coming back. We will be able to get, you know, gates and we will be able to get um, money in to make the, the big, big fights. And I'm sure that people will come back and, and support boxing like they always have. At the moment, we're just trying to provide it on as many broadcasters as possible. And you see, you know, fight and premiere and all sorts getting involved. And that's great. You know, when you can't see a fight, that's that's really not good. I mean, we'd like to have done all those fights, but we can't. Andy, we can't. We're not in a in a business position to do that. So we have to do what we we, we do with Matchroom with our contract, and we do what we can and on British soil. But there's so many great fights out there that it's really good. That people have got the chance to, you know, to to see whatever they want and, and make their choices. And you know, there's some really good fights that are going on. So it's fantastic. Adam, let's go back over this past weekend, as I mentioned earlier on. We saw Conor Ben produce career-best performance over Sebastian Formella with that um, unanimous decision victory. A brilliant display from Conor. When he was going through a week with him, we all saw the emotional interviews he was giving throughout. Going into the fight, was there any concerns at all that maybe that emotion could override him? And was you surprised or to see just how good a performance he did pull out of a bag on Saturday night? It was, it was obviously going to be a, a tough night for Conor Ben and, you know, for everybody, you know, he's fighting sort of, you know, in this period because, you know, there's a lot of intensity, a lot of pressure and you could see with Conor how much he's missed his family in Australia and how much he's dedicated. And what I like about him is that, you know, that, you know, he, he's, as he said before, he could be in silk pajamas, he could be just doing the easy thing, he could be, you know, sort of almost taking, you know, soft fights, whatever, but he wants to test himself and he wants to be his own man. We all know how great his dad was. I like the fact Nigel sort of stayed away and, you know, just overlooked things, but actually Tony Sims has, has, has been given the charge of, of Conor Ben and it really Conor Ben wants to be first in the gym and the last out. And I love that attitude. You know, you're going to go through ups and downs, A, in a career, and B, obviously, in the, in, the, in the state of the world at the moment. And it is hard. And I think we saw a lot of different sides of Connor in the, in the bubble because, you know, he probably thought, felt differently every day. You know, it's, it's uh, and I think he spoke. There was an interesting uh, interview with Devin Peterson, the darts player, um, actually, you know, saying that he watched that Conor Ben interview and he was like, you know, I, I really feel the same way. We're all missing our families at a time like this. You know, I've been in the bubble the last few weeks. You know, I, I miss mine, my kids. You know, it, it's it's difficult. It's it's not it's not the same. Um, but we all have to adapt. And I think with Conor, you know, he he knew that he had to go in and, and deliver a performance. I think with him sometimes you do get the sort of, do I want to fight and a scrap and a tear up and a, and a knockout or can I stick to a sort of boxing plan? And I think the idea was, was very simple that, you know, he wanted to come away with a win. A lot of people before didn't think he would, didn't think he was good enough, thought Formella, you know, was, was too strong at this stage and coming off the, the, the distance fight with Sean Porter. But, you know, Formella probably had a slightly, you know, padded record early on. You know, I, I knew he was good, but not spectacular. So, you know, I felt Connor probably could, could find a way of navigating through. What impressed me more than anything is that he completely dominated Formella. 
I thought he was terrific on the night. I, I thought he showed a massive variety. I thought his jab was excellent, that he was throwing uppercuts and body shots. And I think he's a really improving work in progress, Connor. And I think he's obviously utilized this year to, uh, to work on things with Tony. He's obviously a sponge. He's a fast learner. You know, he, he's had 20 amateur fights. It's going to take time. He's only 24. He's had four professional career years uh, already as a, a pro. And he's, you know, he's been under the spotlight each and every time. He had that tear up with Cedric Pano. But, you know, Darren Barker was saying in, 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 in the bubble, I had that life and death with Conor McIntosh, you know, in, in, in the same sort of number of fights at your call. You know, I got floored that twice in a round, you know. I still became a world champion. OK, we don't have that, you know, Darren was a great amateur. We don't have that with Conor. But I think that, look, it's... It's a very, very bright future. He's got great personality. People love that sort of raw emotion. The fact is, you know, you hear the same sort of mannerisms, you know, in statements as his dad. That takes people back. He's got the name. And he's, you know, he's a fighter. And we love to see it. And he wants to go and give entertainment. And probably when he got a bit sloppy on Saturday nights, because he wanted the knockout. Formella was cheap, tough, and, and terrifically strong. And, you know, well, well done for him for getting through the 10 rounds. But it was so one-sided. And I don't think anyone thought it'd be that one-sided beforehand, apart from Connor's team. And I, I think he boxed really well. I was so I was so pleased for him. Um, pleased that Formella took his lumps and went the distance. I thought it was a, a, a great night with you know a great fight from that reason. It was one-sided, but you know he, he showed his um, his his heart in there, Formella. So he deserves credit. But as far as Connor Ben goes, brilliant, best performance so far in his seventeenth fight. He's obviously learning a great deal. Um, and there's so many fights out there for him. Let's not get carried away. Let's not say he's going to go and, you know, fight the likes of, of Crawford and Spence and all the, the top elite, you know, welterweights at the moment. But there's a, a great bunch of domestic welterweights, you know, the likes of, you know, Josh Kelly, obviously, is a fight that he really wants. And Chris Jenkins, the British champion. There's so many out there um, around the domestic scene that I think that, you know, that's what he should look at next. I think there's some great fights. You know, I know Nigel was saying afterwards, oh, we will beat Chris Jenkins. He's beyond, you know just one step at a time you know he did what was asked of him and his toughest ask to date is his toughest test against formella and he came through with with flying colors he boxed brilliant take a little rest back in the gym and let's plan for some of these big fights next year because there's a lot of viewers who want to see the Conor ben story that's evident to us on digital on linear he's very very popular and um i think people just are engaged by that personality you know, he's, um, he's, he's great. You sort of can't take your eyes off him, can you? And you don't quite know what's going to happen next. He's got this sort of slightly disjointed style where he boxes really well and then he'll, you know, have a swing up. And I think people like that. So let's not say he's going to become a, you know, a, 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 a world champion. He's not even a British champion yet. But I think there's a long way to go with Conor Ben. And I think he might surprise a few people. You mentioned what could be next for Adam uh, in your answer there, Adam. One fight which he was very keen on, and he's been very keen on, is that Josh Kelly one. Do you see that happening next year, certainly maybe towards the back end of it? I do. I do see that happening. You know, um, Adam Booth was with us and, and, and working and was excellent on the night. And, you know, as he said, he, he gave his, his credit and respect to Connor, and it was good to see that performance. But he'll back his man, Josh Kelly. Kelly's got a, a huge fight, and that's absolutely right, as Adam said on Saturday, the only uh, thing that matters. Um, is the the fight with uh, with Avenesian? You know that's the, the only thing that matters at the moment, and that's going to happen at the back end of January. It's a huge fight that should have happened a few months ago, as we know. Um, so let's let's have a look at that one. Josh has got to prove himself in that fight first. Um, but I think that that is a natural fight. You know, they are they're two different characters. Um, they look very different. They come from different stock. One's a terrific top amateur. You know, the other one's the son of Nigel and has done it the sort of harder way. You know, Josh has got the beautiful skills and, and look can look, you know, a, a million dollars sometimes in the ring, the way he flows. But Connor's got that attitude. That, I think it's fantastic. I think it's a really, really great narrative. It's a great, great domestic rivalry. But it could be for, you know, for something bigger. It could be for European titles. It could be for... So I don't think it'll happen next. I don't think it'll happen maybe even the fight after. So I'm looking at maybe next summer as an absolute blockbuster. Maybe they have a couple of fights each first and we build up to it. Maybe they appear on the same bill etc and then bomb you know have a little bit of a test our test at ringside and we can really get our teeth into it because i think that is an absolutely fantastic matchup and i'd really like to see it in 2021 and i'm sure you would too 
100% I would do indeed, Adam. Uh, moving forwards again onto another final card. We saw Fabio Wardley stop Richard Larty in the second round. After the fight, it's only over social media, some people suggesting Larty maybe took a dive. You, you was obviously there. You've seen the knockout. I'm sure you watched it back. What are your thoughts on it? A lot of thoughts about that fight. First of all, um, Richard Larty's ring walk was one of the greatest ring walks I think I've ever seen in any year. Um, I don't know who he thought he was, and it was almost like one step forward and two back. I mean, he, he took long, he took the longest time I've ever seen to go sort of 50 yards. Um, anyway, he had a great time, and it was, a, it was a lot of fun. Thank God we weren't on a tight schedule. Um, still, look, he came into the ring full of confidence. He spoke all week about how he was, was going to come back and you know, beat our other heavyweights. He, he went the distance with Nathan Gorman. He gave Daniel Dubois a real go. And I thought in the first round, he looked really up for it. You know, I thought he, he, he put the pressure, he gloves up. He almost old man Wardley out in the first round. And then the second round, naked eye, when he went down and the way that his legs went, it looked like that power had, had been, you know, had, had sort of followed through from Fabio Wardley and a great knockout win. You know, yes, looking back at it, obviously it is slightly innocuous. The punches, you know, half land one's blocked slightly around the temple there were a couple of jams he was caught with before that the build-up who knows I, I don't think it looked like a dive to me with the way his legs went because his legs just sort of you know collapsed upon him plus he had all the attention afterwards and I didn't see him backstage because we can't go to that area with the COVID testing but Eddie and everybody else told me that, that he looked like a man who'd, who'd really been badly affected by it so I can take their word for it. it. It, you know, it looked to me as though, you know, maybe the, the punches had an effect in some way on him that was, you know, slightly odd. Don't know. It's certainly the, the replays didn't make it conclusive looking back. But look, you can't take anything away from it. Fabio Wardley's nearly knocked every single one of his opponents out. He obviously carries big power and he obviously hurt him. And at the end of the day, he gets the stoppage win. So he gets the win. He does it quicker than... than Dubois or, or obviously Gorman did different fights, different circumstances. Maybe they took something out of Richard Larty. Maybe you know Dubois and Gorman deserve credit for their wins. They took something out, and Fabio just finished him off. I don't know, but what I do know was that he was up for it, wanted to win, and you could just see by the ring walk. I mean, otherwise he would have been you know just straight in the ring, got on with it, and wanted to get out. It didn't look like that to me, and it didn't look like that in the first round. And certainly, I think he felt the force of some of Wardley's punches. And, OK, it didn't look dramatic. I can understand people saying that, you know, suspecting things afterwards. And if that's the case, the board will pick it up and have a look at it. Um, but for me, better to concentrate on Wardley winning. It's 10 out of 10 for him. And I think he'll go on next year to fight for a British title. On paper, it is, you know, second round stoppage for Fabio. We know Daniel took a couple of rounds more. Daniel Dubois, that is, and Nathan took him the distance. With that being said, can we take anything from that? What, from the fact that he, he won so quickly? He got, he got um, Larty out there quicker than what Daniel did. I, th I think, you know, I think, look, you know, I mentioned in commentary, he did it quicker than Daniel Dubois. You know, Fabio Wardley's no Daniel Dubois yet. You know, Daniel Dubois is much more proven. You know, and, and he was first up against, against um, uh, Richard Larty, you know, so you don't know what it's taken out of him. Different styles make different fights. Always very hard to compare, you know, very difficult. You know, Daniel Dubois has got a big fight with Joe Joyce. Fabio Wardley moves on. But I think, yeah, I think whatever people are saying out there, that can give his confidence. You know, he won the fight. He won the fight. And whether he would have done it in the second round or the fourth or fifth round, I think, you know, he, he proved himself that he's, he's got something, Fabio. And I think the show on Saturday night, I know you asked me about Babbage in a minute, the show on Saturday night was all about pretty much three guys on, on the on the matching side with Alan Babich, Fabio Wardley and Conor Ben. Questioning sort of how far are they going to go in the sport? We don't know. Fabio Wardley was a white collar fighter. Conor Ben had very little amateur experience. And Alan Babich, who knows with that style, how far he's going to go. But I'll tell you what, they were all meant to be tests. It didn't turn out that much with Babich. It didn't turn out that much with Formella. It didn't turn out that much with Larty. Didn't know beforehand. Larty came with proven credentials. You know, Tom Little was in the best shape of his life. And Sebastian Formella had just done the distance to Sean Porter was unbeaten up to that point. And people beforehand were saying Conor Ben was going to lose. So, you know, you can't win. In the end, it did turn out to be fairly one-sided. But what we did learn was that all those three have got very interesting futures ahead of them. But we don't know how far they're going to go. Are you going to ask me, Alan Babich, will he become a world champion? 
Fabio Wardley will have become a world champion. Conor Ben will have become a world champion. You know, I mean, I'm not going to say that, am I? I don't think anyone can say that. We don't know how far they're going to go. But what we do know is that they're winning, they're impressing, they're unbeaten, and the story goes on. And we're all going to be fascinated watching it. And I tell you, it wouldn't surprise me if one of them crept through to a pretty high level. Who knows which one? Can you tell me? Unfortunately, I can't, Adam. Um, again, <laughs> I'm going to to another man you mentioned about, Alan Babich. He again delivers but what he says on the team. He comes and he brings war, and we just saw him throw a number and a number of shots uh, throughout his fight with Tom Little. But was you surprised or we never saw more from Tom? especially because of a build-up and what he said with regards to how he saw the fight going? Yeah, had a long chat with Tom the, uh, on the weigh-in day, and he was absolutely convinced he was going to win. He was in the shape of his life. I think the problem is, you know, he has lost a number of times, and we know that he gives everything, but in the heat of battle, he can come apart. And, you know, ultimately, that it's all about levels in this sport. And, you know, he, he landed a few in, in the first round, and, you know, he thought maybe if he, if he stuck with him and, you know, whether the storm, whether he could come on strong late. And ultimately, Babich was just too relentless, too strong, too good for him. So... You know, it was a bit disappointing, I suppose. I think there's going to be no one more disappointed than Tom Little. He's a lovely guy. You know, you sort of want him to get a win or two and, and, and try and find a way. But, you know, he's, he's, he's had a lot of stoppage defeats in a row now. And I'm, I'm disappointed because I know he worked really hard for this and got himself in the best shape he could possibly have done. So I think, look, you've got to give credit to Babich. He's gone about it. He's done it again. Is it pretty? No. Is it effective? You bet. And, uh, you know, he came at 15-3. I think he wanted to prove he's a heavyweight, even if he's a small one. I think he was quite annoyed that we keep saying he's a blown-up cruiser. But, you know, Babich is what he is. He's the savage. He's a great character. You know, you don't know whether he's going to be the nice Alan or the, or the, the terror that's the savage. It's a lot of fun. And, you know, it's all about entertainment, this business. How far he's going to go, who knows? You know, you, you know, is Eddie going to throw him in with the likes of, of, you know, the world champions? Of course not. You know, is he going to throw him in with Philip Hergovich? Probably not. You know, is he going to keep him winning or keep him, you know, keep giving him mini tests and try and roll with it and give the fans entertainment? Yeah, of course. But we're not going to know much more about Alan Babich until he's hurt, till he's backed up, till he's in with a real heavyweight. You can, you know, you can pop him and can back him up and really hurt him. And Alan wants to be tested like that. He says, then you'll find out about me. And that's what we all want to see. It's, um, you know, it's unlikely to happen in the early part of his career, is it? You know, you need to build a fighter up. But he is 30. You know, you don't, you know what you've got with him. It is what it says on the tin. So um, who knows when Eddie will push that button and really, really test him. But there's a lot of heavyweights out there that it will be, um, there'll be some real fun fights with him. And, you know, he's going he's gonna to lose at some point. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how that happens and whether he can come back and, you know, learn from that. But there's obviously something that's very attractive about Alan Babich. People like him. You know, he is absolutely all or nothing. And, um, you know, it is an entertainment business, isn't it? You know, and how far he goes, we don't know. Whether he'll, you know, the bridge of weight, whether, you know, the, the small heavyweights, I don't know. Could he go in and do that against the likes of, you know, his own man, Dillian, or, I mean, he spars with him, or, you know, your, your Joshua and Fury. I mean, you, you've, you've, you've got to worry, haven't you? Or well, certainly you've got to take a lot of time with him. But he'll do it. He'll find them all tomorrow. He'll probably line them up and have a go at all of them. And that's what we want to see. You know, it's a, it's a no-fear attitude. It's a belief in himself. He wants a fight. He wants a tear-up. That's how he boxes. And there's obviously some good he's doing because he's getting rid of these fighters. And he's getting rid of them impressively. So well done, Alan Babich. On we go. In your eyes, Adam, is there anyone in particular who you think would be a good little step up for Alan now who will maybe throw back a bit more, maybe look to push him back rather than boxing on the back foot themselves. Is there anybody who springs to mind that you'd like to see him in with? Well, Tom Little was the one I wanted to see him in with this time. So that's interesting. And, and I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of fights out there, aren't there? There's a lot of heavyweights. You know, you look at the sort of smaller heavyweights like Michael Hunter and you think, and then you think, you know, the sort of the other young prospects, like obviously he wants to fight Hergovic. You, 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 you know, I don't know, Martin Bacoli, Sergei Kuzman, Huey Fury, Marius Back, they're all fighting each other. You know, there's, it's, you know, there are heavyweights out there, but I think, you know, 
that's for his team to sit down with and work out, you know, what they think the next strategy is. You know, he's got a great guy with him in Dillian White, who's been in with all the heavyweights. So, um, you know, it's probably up to him to, to sort of advise him and say, right, or do they take a, a real roll of the dice? They take a big fight and, um, you know, see, see how he goes. It's, it'd be interesting to see. Moving forwards once again, Adam, and just on to some other topics. Uh, you mentioned it earlier on, Dubai Joyce this coming weekend. Adam, just give me a preview for it. What are you expecting from the fight and how are you expecting it to play out? I cannot wait for the fight. I'm so excited. I was talking to Adam Booth about it on, on Saturday. I really, really like both of them. You know, Daniel Dubois, I voted for his young boxer of the year at the, at the writers. I think he's got everything, the attributes, the big jab, the power. I think, you know, he can go a long, long way in this sport. But I really like Joe Joyce as well, too. You know, Joyce is, you know, has the pedigree, more pedigree as an amateur, you know, and, and people are saying, oh, he's old and, you know, he gets hit too much. But I tell you what, he is... It's all about people who are relentless and who are strong and tough. You know, we mentioned the Babbitt. Joe Joyce is strong, he's tough. And he can box too as well. And, you know, Adam was saying, look, you know, I, I sort of think fancy Joyce in this fight because he's sort of the more proven in many ways. And, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's, you know, the classic case to look at it is Dubois early or Joyce late. You know, if, if Joyce can, can survive the power. I think what, I think I lean towards Dubois because... I just think with the smaller gloves, that power could be the difference. You know, the body shots, the jab. I think he's got that extra bit of power. But Joyce has got a great chin. So I, I think it's a really, really intriguing fight. I cannot wait for it. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it goes either way. I think I'll lean towards Dubois just on the fact that I think he's a bit more organized, a bit more structured, a bit more power. And, and I just think Joyce gets hit a little bit too much. And I wonder if with the small gloves on, that's going to make the difference. But if he can take his power, you've got to lean towards Joyce going late on and, and you know, causing the upset because he will be the big underdog, Joe Joyce, but I'm not writing him off. I like both of them. And what I like about this fight is that both can come again. It's a great match. Frank's put a great match on and, uh, you know, we're going to sit back and enjoy it. And let's see, the winner can go on, you know, into towards you know, world title contention. And the loser's got plenty of places to go. You know, it's it's not over. I like, and if it's great, they could do it again. You know, we like these matches. It's fantastic. So listen, may the best man win. I like both of them. You know, I've probably spent more time around Joe Joyce. You know, I wish them well. And I think that it's a, it's a fantastic fight for the fans. So yeah, I cannot wait for that. And then we go towards, you know, AJ and Pulev and, and the, the world heavyweight title, you know, and this is what these guys are aiming at, you know, AJ and Fury, the standout fighters in the world at the moment. And we've got Anthony Joshua before Christmas in a dangerous fight against Kubrat Pulev. You know, people are overlooking him. He's got one loss to Vladimir Klitschko. He's proven over years and years. He believes he can do exactly what Andy Ruiz did to Joshua. Joshua looks terrific in training. Cannot wait for that. So we've got a real heavyweight feast. So uh, I can sit back, enjoy myself and watch Dubois Joyce. Wish them both well and well done. It's a brilliant match to make. And obviously in the night on Saturday night, we see that Mike Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. fight. Adam, obviously both of them returning to the ring after, in Tyson's case, many more years out than what Roy Jones is. is. But what are you expecting to see from them comes Saturday? It's not a fight I like to see. Um, I, I, you know, I looked up to Mike Tyson. He was absolutely magnetic. He was brilliant when he was at his peak. And I worked with him for the sort of second half of his career. Roy Jones, I thought there was a window where he could have, you know, if he'd retired after winning the heavyweight title against John Ruiz, I think he would have gone down as one of the best five fighters of all time. There was that window where he was just untouchable, a genius, but he went on way, way too long. So in many ways, it's a sad thing to see because um, I like to remember them for, for what they were, the, the great fighters of old. You know, we're not we're not here to, to tell fighters not to do something. And it's it's better that they're fighting each other, not not a young pup, obviously. But you know, they're 50 something. And for me, that's that's not a place to be in the boxing ring. Um, it's an exhibition, and I just hope that they both uh, get out unscathed. I hope they're both fine when they get out. They're two legends of the sport, and it's not something I'm really happy about, excited about, or, you know, or as I said, I watch it because it's, it's you know, you, 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 I almost want to watch it to make sure they're both okay afterwards because it's it's a difficult one. You know, it's not something I'm, I'm getting excited about. It's something that I'm, 
you know, I'm more like that. I'm, I'm more like this to remember them for who they were. You know, they're great fighters. And if they want to challenge themselves, I wish they would challenge themselves in slightly different ways. But having said that, you know, it's Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson will do what he wants to do. And Roy Jones, you know, is, is they're both, you know, they're both legends of the sport. They're both great. And I just wish we could remember them like they were, as opposed to what we're going to see on Saturday night. Final thing, Adam. Uh, we've seen today, Adam, Matt Eddie's reached out to the government mm. to try and get some funding for boxing. We've seen various other sports receive some. Firstly, is it a surprise to you that boxing hasn't been considered, or if it has been considered, has been overlooked? Or, and, or secondly, do you think things could change, certainly at least for the amateur scene? Big surprise. And uh, Eddie and I talked about this last week and I'm really pleased he's done that. And I'm right behind him and anyone else that is involved in this. I think it's not just Eddie. I think it will take Frank. I think it will take Robert Smith on the board. I think it will take a lot of people to sort of get behind this sort of momentum. And I think we should be pushing because, yes, boxing is a fantastic sport for the young. We know about the, the advantages of it, the discipline, the structure, the dedication, the, you know, the, 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 the opportunities it gives. And I think that at this time where grassroots and amateur boxing are suffering, you know, we're going to send a fantastic team to Tokyo, Team GB, as a wonderful setup in Sheffield. But we need impetus and we need that for the small hall and we need it for the amateurs. So I'm absolutely right behind it, Andy. And if there's anything we can do to push the government to help this, we will, we should be. Adam, we will leave that there now. I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of your day. And obviously, I was going to say a week off whenever there'll be stuff going on, but a week outside the bubble. <laughs> Adam, a week outside the bubble. A week outside the bubble. You know, it's always 24 7. But yeah, it's, uh, it's nice to be, uh, to be at home. Um, for a few days and uh, but you know then you'll miss it won't you and you'll get back you know we, we were speaking to Billy Joe actually when he was in the bubble and, and from his training camp and he was saying you know oh, I can't wait to get in there I'm thinking oh you know it's a, it's a different setup you know but uh, we'll all be together next week and um, yeah and then obviously the big one for AJ Pula which we can't wait for but uh, yeah looking forward to putting my feet up and watching uh, boxing on the other side this weekend. Adam, enjoy the coming shows of this weekend, man, and I will catch up with you soon. Thank you for your time as always, and thank you for speaking to Boxing Social. Cheers, Andy. Take care, mate.